Welcome to our artist panel this morning. I am pleased to introduce you to our guests of honor. Uh, all the way down on the end, we have Alicia, who is a member of our uh, of our community at large. She has recently made a, a game called War Torn, so she is also a game designer in addition to being an artist. Um, and uh, you probably know her best from chat as Alicia Volkman, AKA Artist for Hire. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, that is Alicia. In the middle here, but not to be slighted, just because she's in the middle, uh, is Abelheid Zimmerman. She is also an artist at large in the game crafter community and also a game designer in the game crafter community. Um, and uh, she has been uh, the artist, the only, I think, one of two guests that we've had on the Game Crafter official podcast. So that's what it's going to do. Uh, and then, uh, oh, and also owns Dropnar Press, uh, which, which does uh, 15th century. Yeah, 15th, 16th century uh, reproductions of woodblock prints. Yes, so she does restorations of these amazing old uh, woodblock art pieces. Um, uh, and then, probably needs no introduction, but I will do it anyway. Uh, John Kabalik. Uh, you probably know him best from as the artist who did the Munchkin art. Uh, he also did art for lots of other games like Snake Oil and Apples to Apples. And of course, he is the artist behind, uh, and do you also write the, the comic? Story? Yes. And also yes. writes the book of comic. So uh, he is uh, prolific, and you may have seen his amazing uh, Owl Fork Fair plushies that are around in the convention this year. So he also designed those. So uh, without further ado, first panel. <laughs> uh, I guess, do we have any questions to start? Do we, do we want a moderator or do we, uh, are you guys mostly interested in how to get into uh, gaming art or like the aspects of our lives or what, what do you guys? Each, uh, tell us a little bit about how you got into gaming, okay. gaming art. Um, okay, I'll start. Uh, so uh, fresh out of high school, I started working on um, just, you know, putting myself out there. Who needs this? Who needs what? I'm not charging anybody. I just wanted to do art. It was like my favorite thing in the world to do. And uh, I started off doing like flash game art. And you know, just a lot of the indie stuff, new grounds, things like that. And then I moved into uh, app development. And just some random guy who I still work with today was like, hey, I do apps. And I never publish them, but I want just art for them. And so I still work in, with, with him today. And I did apps, apps, apps. And then one day, I was lucky enough to come across a guy who was making a card game for Kickstarter. And this was back in like 2009, 2011 or whatever, whenever Kickstarter had like first started. And uh, he never funded. It wasn't you know, the best card game ever, and it wasn't the best art in the world. I was still really young. And I think I was uh, pretty lucky because that introduced me to the game crafters. It introduced me to all the indie designers. It introduced me to this whole niche and this whole world of people who needed art, they needed it to be reasonably priced, and they needed someone who was willing to work with them on the budgets that most indie designers don't have. Um, and that's just, that's how I got into it, you know? I met the great community, I met great people, and they were willing to give me a chance. And that's kind of how I got into it, so. I got into um, game design. My first job outside of, after getting my BFA at the University of Iowa in graphic design, was to make the blister packs for the resale of magic and Yu-Gi-Oh cards that you find near the Cash Grab at Target. So they buy a bunch of um, leftover remaindered cards and repackage it at a discount. And they needed someone to do all of their blister packs and um, design their die cuts for their boxes and that sort of thing. And I've always come from, um, I've always been more interested in the print side of the world. Um, what I do otherwise than gaming is the letterpress prints. And so, while I started out in web with um, banner ads and that sort of thing, it was print that really drew me into graphic design. And that's what I really studied when I was in college. And once I got a taste of gaming, I'd always been a gamer. You know, I'd always played RPGs in high school and that sort of thing. I was like, hey, there's this thing I could do. And it takes one of my passions, gaming, and what I want to spend my days doing, which is graphic design, and puts it together into one thing. So uh, what I try to offer people is the knowledge of a layout print professional who plays a lot of games and understands the very unique graphic design needs of a product that has 
cards and a box and a board and all these intricate different components that all need to come together and look like they're part of one single piece, despite the fact that they're all very different things. You know, that's that's what what I love about doing art for the game world. Um, <clears throat> I I fell into uh, games illustrations. I was the editorial cartoonist for the Wisconsin State Journal uh, here in town. Um, and in the early 90s, I did a cartoon. I'd been a gamer since high school. Uh, I mean, I was like, you know, it was probably second wave of D&D. &D. Um, I, uh, and I just always loved gaming. I loved board gaming. I loved role playing. I loved miniature games. Um, so when I did a cartoon about the O.J. Simpson trial, which is like how long ago this was, um, I, I, just for fun, one of, the, well, one of the O.J. Simpson lawyers had said that there was a conspiracy out to get O.J. Simpson. And I was a huge fan of Steve Jackson games, so as soon as I heard conspiracy, I knew that I was throwing the Bavarian Illuminati into this editorial cartoon. And I, just for, again, just for fun, I faxed the cartoon down to Steve Jackson games. I, you know, really didn't know anybody there or anything, but... It's like, hey, I'm drawing the Bavarian Illuminati. Why not, you know, throw, why not show it to them? And then I got a phone call from the marketing director of Steve Jackson Games. Uh, I was at the newspaper, and she said, yes, Steve saw the cartoon. He loved it. He pointed out that there was a typo in it. Um, and he also wanted to know if you want to start drawing Murphy's Rules for us, which was a, a long running, uh, still going on their website, uh, comic feature that took the quirkiest rules and uh, drew them as they literally would be if, you know, the rules, I mean, these are rules that make no sense, and so you draw the situations. And so at that, from that point on, uh, yeah, I just uh, was in heaven. I was drawing this stuff for Steve Jackson Games. I. Um, it was in their monthly magazine, Pyramid, which was then a print publication. I, I heard that they were coming out with a collectible card game. Uh, this was Illuminati New World Order. And I, I just asked them if they needed any extra art. And this being Steve Jackson Games at the time, they were behind deadline and they desperately needed more cards. So I got a gig drawing about 20 cards for that. And that sort of snowballed into the guys uh, who launched Out of the Box Games here in Madison saw that. And so they wanted me to come on board and uh, do this new game that they were forming the company to publish. Not Apples Apples. Apples Apples was our second game. Um, the first game was called Bosworth. And somehow this turned into, this changed for me just illustrating the game to me being an investor in the company. Um, and that was pretty much it. Uh, a couple, I was getting very dissatisfied at the State Journal, um, not because of the editorial cartoon, but because I was having to do a lot of other things, um, a lot of uh, um, inputting entertainment calendars, and then all of a sudden they wanted me to start covering the police speech at, on Saturday nights, and it's like, are you crazy? Do you have any idea how spectacularly bad I would be at being a cop reporter? Uh, what on earth are you thinking? And by the way, this is the start of the news, it's called the newspaper industry. I, I like to think they're connected somehow. Uh, but I quit, and it's like my wife said that she would support me, and within a year, I was making as much money uh, doing freelance web design and the gaming cartoons uh, as I was at the paper. Um, which actually says a lot more about newspapers than it does about, you know, the freelance pay. Um, and it just kind of never looked back. I've been, you know, really, really lucky. I've been involved in two once-in-a-lifetime games, Apples to Apples and Munchkin. So that's, you know, been ridiculous as far as I'm concerned. And I love it.
I go to gaming conventions and do a lot, spend a lot of time talking to people and letting them know what I do. Um, a lot of game designers don't really understand what happens between designing an awesome game and sending it to the printer. There's, there's a ton of stuff that has to happen. You need to find awesome illustrations, and you need to find a graphic designer who can put it together and get it ready for press. And those, those, those things are kind of hidden in the gaming world. You, you, you pick up a game, and you know who designed it, but do you know who did the rest of the process? You might not. You might know the publisher, but um, there's this segment of the process that isn't, isn't as visible. So I spend a lot of time just educating people about that section of the process and talking to them about it and showing them my work and that sort of thing, which means that, oh, no, I have to go to gaming conventions. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'll be there anyway. <laughs> um, but that is the primary way that I get, I get um, work to do, to work on games. Um, for me, it's kind of a mix of both. Um, I do definitely get a lot of art, uh, a lot of requests for commissions. Sometimes people get me busy for a month solid, JT. And, uh, and, and that's nice. And then you'll have gaps. And I think that's the big thing about being an artist is if you're not getting constant work, you need to make sure you budget. And uh, so I do spend a lot of time online looking for jobs, asking people, talking to people. Um, a big help for me is there are websites like conceptart.org. Uh, and you can literally go on there and people just post jobs for artists. You can pick and choose, you can apply for them. And that's great, but for me in particular, what helps great is building a community and joining a community of just people. And that's great, because then you'll get uh, people who are like, oh, well, I, she did art for me. You should, you should hire her, or you should look at her. And it's all word of mouth with artists these days. Um, you know, just people being like, hey, go to her. Hey, go to her. The um, references came for sure. Yeah, they're, they're huge for me in particular. It's just. You know, if you, if you lay out that reputation for yourself, if you're on time or if you're early, um, if you're always living down good art and you're always working with people and doing what they need, you're going to get people coming for you. And that's how I stay within the industry. Yeah, sure. Uh, do you guys want to start? Or? Yeah, I mean, and with me, um, it's not really working with designers. I work with art directors. Uh, so with a gaming company, the, um, the art side is normally, it has got nothing to do, oh, I don't say this, not, not that it's got nothing to do, but you're not talking with the development people for the most part in, in a large company like Steve Jackson Games. Um, with Out of the Box, we did it a little bit differently, and that was more designed by committee, which I really kind of hated. Um, but we were a small company, and there were five of us, and everybody got a say on the art. Um, I, I, I personally much prefer it when, like, uh, there is a art director who knows his or her stuff. Uh, to me, an art director, a good art director, is kind of like a good conductor. They will bring so much more out of the artist. Uh, I, Fantasy Flight, I loved working with Fantasy Flight on uh, this one project, uh, a game called Mag Blast, uh, years ago. Um, whereas with Steve Jackson Games, at this point in time, uh, for Munchkin, Steve, and I've worked with Steve now for 15 years on Munchkin, so this is more like kind of a, a marriage, an old married couple. <laughs> Um, Steve Jackson Games knows pretty much what to expect from my art, and I know pretty much what they're expecting. Um, so I still try to push myself there, and I still try to make every project better, but I will literally get an art specification that just says, you know what to do, John. <laughs> and nine times out of ten, I will. And I know exactly what they're looking for. So. Uh, my, my art specs for a Munchkin project will be at most one, maybe two sentences, a list of 150 cards with very, very brief descriptions. Um, I'm working with much smaller companies. So, so the people that I'm working for, I'm working for a game designer who's self-publishing, who's going to crowdfund, or I'm working for a, um, a small publisher who does not have an art director. And so I will sometimes be working with both the designer and the publisher and try to come up with something that everyone's happy with. And in those situations, you, you really have to 
make sure that they understand what the process is. Since they don't have an art director, they don't know how the process is going to go. They don't really understand that you're not going to give them something perfectly polished because they have a budget. They don't want you to give them three examples that are done and pick the best one, right? No, they want a bunch of concept sketches, but they don't necessarily understand where a concept sketch is going, really. And so there's a lot of kind of stumbling that happens along that process, trying to create art that matches the imagination of non-artists. And I can agree with that. Um, I strictly work with designers. Like, that's all I work with. Um, and I guess that probably works great with this crowd because you're all probably indie designers. Um, and you don't have art directors. You don't have, you might not even have a team. You might just be you. And when it comes down to that, one is don't be afraid to approach the artists because we're usually really great people. Uh, we're usually pretty friendly and we're just as nervous talking to designers as you guys are talking to artists. Um, something big for me is when uh, a, a designer comes to me and what makes it easier is if you know what you want. And then we love artistic freedom, but we need direction. Um, if we don't have enough direction, uh, then you might need to push us just a little bit harder so you can get exactly what you want and so it looks nice. Um, and like she says, you know, we'll, we can give you sketches, we can give you rough designs, but you need to tell us early enough and you need to be a, a direct as enough as possible to be like, hey, I need it like this. And so that way we're not spending hours or even weeks on a piece of art, and then you want to change the whole thing because we didn't know what you wanted. So um, basically, if you're, if you're uh, yeah, I think I. <laughs> absolutely true. It's a very important point. If you're hiring an artist, give them as much information as possible. I mean, you want to give your artist freedom, and you feel like that's a great way for them to express themselves, but really, we are going to be able to flower best when you give us very precise, this is what I want, and then we'll work within that. And that, that, you, that will get you what you want a lot faster. Did we answer the question, or did I kind of skip past it? Okay, <laughs> I wasn't sure. Um, it seems that artists often get exploited, and even as a non-artist, I see that, and Can I take this one? Um, sorry. I, I deal with this a lot. I deal with this almost every day. Um, so when you approach an artist and you are like, hey, I don't have a big budget. Um, I don't have a ton of money. What can I do for you? Um, and I deal with this every day. I don't lay down, well, hey, I want this much upfront, whatever. I work with everybody I can. Um, I'll say, hey, can you do half upfront and half upon completion? Yes. If no, I can do three pieces this week, three pieces next week, three pieces this week, and I can work with your budget. Um, I did a game recently, Honey Wars, and he actually won the uh, game whole contest. Um, and he was like, Alicia, you know, I don't want to break my bank. I want to make sure I have money to pay my bills. Can I pay you every paycheck? Yeah, that's totally fine. And that's what's nice about working with your artists is because they want to be paid, you want the art, but you know, they don't necessarily need it all up front. So just talk with your artists. Usually they're willing to bend. And budget. If you can communicate with your art artists what the budget is, they can very honestly say, yes, I can do this for you in that budget, or no, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and here's some resources for you. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I recently worked with someone who had just, they couldn't really afford me, but they had a great game that was so close to awesome. And so I was able to point them to some free resources of like, okay, so... We'll borrow a really nice camera, take a picture of this, that, or the other, pop it into GIMP, and do this, right? And mm -hmm. that's going to take your game from looking like a sketch to looking like someone really polished it up. Mm -hmm. And so that was, I, so I do help people out whenever possible, even if they can't pay me, if I can just give them advice. But if someone comes to me and says, I've got this bu budget, I know it's small, and this is what I need. Sometimes they'll say, well, okay, so I don't know if I can get you what you want, but I can get you what you need. So if you don't mind that I'm, I'm just going to give you 10 hours of my time, and I will work my butt off for those 10 hours, and what you get is what you get, and I hope you're happy with it. 
And those those are sorts of situations that you can come to with artists too. We're, we're, and like she said, um, billing. We're used to budgeting on yearly schedules, right? Like, so if you can't pay me right now, as long as I believe that you're gonna pay me, it's gonna be cool. I th yeah, that's. Those are actually really the core of it. I mean, as long as you're honest with the artists, and you know, the, the one phrase an artist never wants to hear is, "But think of the exposure you'll get." Oh God! <laughs> um, you know, there's the long-running joke of everybody who's died of exposure. Um, you know, that that just uh, that really uh, smacks of such disrespect for the artist. Um, and you know, most artists will realize that some. Publishers just don't have the resources, and you know maybe you've got to look at um, you know, come to a convention and just look for you know artists who have just graduated who are still looking for their first gig. Um, but you know just be honest, be upfront, uh, let them know what the situation is, and if if you can't afford a particular artist, I'm sure you know, most of them will be really willing to help you find somebody who might suit your needs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what, uh, what, when each of you talk about how you charge for a project, you charge by the project, by the piece, by the hour, that sort of thing. How do you work out the, the schedule to get right into it? I always charge by the hour. I used to charge by the project. I used to bid things out. But I got so many people who were like, well, I paid you, I'm paying you X number of dollars for this, and I'm going to keep bugging you and not pay you until I like it. And that became so infuriating that I gave up. I'm like, you know what? I am worth 40 bucks an hour, and you're going to pay it or not, or I'm not working for you. That's just it. And that has actually been very liberating for me to not have to. It, it's less stressful for me. I feel like it's clearer to my customer. Like, this is, this is it. I, I work hard. I am super efficient. But you're going to pay me by the hour. Um, I work on, I, it might be weird for other artists, sorry, not over your water. Um, I work on, I call it like a, an average. Um, so I, I charge about 20 bucks an hour, and then, and that kind of, uh, I kind of lay it out like, oh, well, sketch will take an hour, and then like, inking might take an hour, and the coloring might take an hour. So I say, average, it'll cost you about $60 for this kind of a piece. Um, but then what I'll also do is I'll say, but that'll include three changes. It'll include uh, three, three small changes, like one major change. And so that way, you're not stuck with a piece you don't like, and I don't have to work a ton of hours without being paid. And, so, and that's what I like to do, because I might spend extra time on it because I wanted this extra detail in here, but maybe I didn't need this extra detail. And I won't charge my client for that, because maybe I'm just being a little OCD. And <laughs> so that's just kind of how I do it. So I charge, you know, I might charge a little bit less, but maybe my quality is not as high as someone else. Or, and that's, you're going to get that with all artists. Is all artists are going to charge differently. And you have to think of what materials they're using, um, what equipment they're using, where they're living. Cost of living in every place is different. Um, so, and they have to pay their bills or if they have to you know, feed their family. And so they might charge more um, So for things like that. I, I pretty much exclusively work on royalties at this point in time. Um, again, I've just been in a very, very fortunate position. Uh, my work is relatively well known in the game industry. A lot of people want me to do work for them. I just simply don't have the time. Um, so I'm really pulling back just to concentrate on Munchkin primarily and my own work, Dork Tower. I will do on occasion uh, pieces for somebody else. So one of the, uh, it's hard to say no to a good friend in the game industry and especially hard to say no if that good friend happens to be a genius game designer. <laughs> Um, and it's, it's honestly, it's a huge privilege um, if somebody like, you know, Mr. Really, or Mrs. or Ms. Uh, really extraordinarily well-known game designer, once you do something for them, that's really hard to say no to. Um, and so I will occasionally, sometimes more than occasionally, break this with friends. But, you know, I, I find a royalty basis with most things seems to work pretty well with an upfront uh, uh, payment against, uh, advance against the royalties. I 
I don't oh, contain, cool. I don't retain control over any of the copyrights. If if someone is paying me by the hour to, for art, it is theirs. It is not mine. Mm -hmm. It is theirs. I do retain the right to use it for self promotional purposes, and that's it. Yeah. I'm exactly the same way. If I'm making it for you, it's yours. You can reproduce it. You can change it. You can do whatever you want with it. Uh, I just ask that I can put it in my portfolio. Yeah, it's. Uh, it's Relatively standard it would be like some variation on these. Um, some people will want to make prints at, for shows like this to sell at their booths, and most publishers are totally okay with that. Um, you know, uh, I I will do little things uh, with some of the Munchkin characters if I've got a charity event, but you know, I make sure that that's okayed by Steve Jackson. Uh, games first, and normally companies are really cool. But yeah, if you're getting paid, if, if you're a publisher, uh, you should retain, at the very least, first publication rights. Now this is actually, this kind of goes back to uh, your question. Um, uh, if you don't have a lot of money, possibly one place for negotiation is in the rights. Maybe you keep first publication rights, but if you can't pay the artist, you then let them use the art for whatever they may want to. If that art has you know, some value, you know, maybe they can use it for another project should the right project come along, or they can do things with the characters they design. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's most, most companies will uh, have some variant on this, and it's all negotiable. Yeah, but always ask your artists. Some artists refuse to give up copyrights, and that's just how they are. So always verify with the artist that you can have full copyright before they even start working. It should be spelled out in the work for hire contract. Yeah. Contracts, yes, we should probably talk about contracts. Yes, Matt? Um, I was going to ask, how important is it for a designer or an art director in that case to have all the specs up front? Like, you mentioned the list of 140 characters. How important is it to have all of that worked out for your artist ahead of time versus saying, I'm going to need major character art, I'm going to need a couple of small cards There's, there's a little bit of wiggle room um, because things always change and you know, there might be some, like some companies will still be working on the rules as it goes along, but there shouldn't be any major changes. I would say no more than 10% of the art specs should change from the start of a project to the end. If it does, you're well within your rights to uh, charge extra to have there be a rush fee for things that need to get done if it's not spelled out immediately. Uh, the, as a game designer, I believe, or as a game company, you want the art specs to be ready. I mean, you should have a deadline for yourself, um, as well as the artist. And once the art specs are ready, that means the game should be ready. And that should be the final stage of the process. Um, there needs to be a kill fee in case the art doesn't get used, um, so that the artist hasn't wasted his or her time. Uh, working on this. Um, but it should be pretty much, you know, it doesn't have to be set in stone, but it should be really pretty darn close to being set in stone at the point that the art specs are delivered and you've got a deadline to work on. Yep. And that's, it's definitely important because, and it's not just important for your artists so they know what they're doing, it's important for you. So let's say you want art on a, a poker card. Um, so I'll probably make it at three or four times the resolution so that way you can shrink it to size. Um, and that way you don't lose any quality. But if I make it at an 8x10 and you decide, well, I want to stretch this up onto a board. You can't stretch that onto a board. It won't be big enough. It'll be extremely distorted. So that's a good reason to have your specs in order. So that way, if you need to use it for something, we have it big enough for you. That's absolutely right. You should know what you need before you ask an art artist to start in on a project. Um, you should know how big it needs to be. You should know where. Um, any text is going to be overlaying an image. They need to know what shape they need to fill, what kind of space needs to be um, just background, what needs to be filled with character. They're going to be able to say, okay, this is what we need. This is what the game's going to look like. This is the size board you're going to need. This is what our box is going to look like. The book is going to get laid out like this. Now, I want you to hire an illustrator to fill this spot with a pretty picture and that spot with a pretty picture. And I can tell you exactly what resolution it needs to be. And then I will take those illustrations and put them into the framework that I've designed. 
and then I can make sure that those files are ready for your press, right? So depending on where you print your game, there's going to be a different set of technical specifications that the, that the digital files need to be in in order to be adequate for that printer and have your work look great, right? So as a graphic designer, I know this. I know all of, I know how the printer, different types of printers work. I know what, what they need. And I can tell you what to tell your illustrator, essentially. Yep, and I just want to add on to that a little bit. Um, she's completely right. Graphic designers are almost mandatory for game design because um, unless you have some kind of a background in layout um, or unless you have a lot of people to go to, to, unless you can show it to like thousands of people, there's no way to guarantee your game's going to be laid out correctly or look nice or function perfectly without a graphic designer. Um, I was lucky enough to start early in art and went to college for graphic design. So I have a little bit, I don't probably have nearly as much background as she does in graphic design, um, but I definitely know the basics. So I can do a pretty logo uh, properly or I can do a decent card layout or a decent booklet layout. Um, but when it comes to things like, you know, your graphic designer will check your words, your graphic designer will go to your printer, your graphic designer will do all those nitty gritty things that your illustrator probably can't do and you probably won't be able to do yourself. Um, so they're definitely needed. It's a, it's a specific, very specific skill set. It that is. is not game design and it is not illustration. It's nope. a different thing and it's the thing that puts those two pieces together and gets it ready for the printer. Yep. I cannot back up what they're saying nearly strongly <laughs> enough. I am not a graphic designer, I'm a cartoonist. Uh, I'm an <laughs> illustrator, I love what I do, um, but if a game company comes to me and says, okay, do this cover. I was like, you're mad. Um, it's not going to look good. You know, they're, they're, it, it is, you know, to me, it is almost like a dark magic thing. I look at, I can recognize great graphic design. It's an amazing thing. The people who can place the elements so that the box works as a whole, so that the cards work as a whole, uh, this is incredible to me. You know, I love drawing my little, you know, silly, funny animals and things like that. Um, but yeah, all props to the people who really know layout, who've got an eye for the graphic design of a project from start to finish. Uh, that it's, it's fantastic. This might also reflect the differences that we mentioned in how we charge. So as an illustrator, he's charging a percentage or a residual. As a graphic designer, I am charging hourly. It's because these are two different skill sets yep. that are approached very differently. Yep, because she's going to spend hours searching, researching, looking, running around. She's going to spend a lot more time doing intense stuff while I'm going to be sitting here doodling. You know, so, and that's, that's a big difference Doodle. in charging. So if you have, uh, <laughs> if you, if you have a, <laughs> sorry, if you have a big, per, you know, if you have a, uh, an artist and they can do everything for you, they're going to charge a lot more because they're doing two jobs for you. Um, and then if you hire two people separately, so you hire an illustrator and a graphic designer, you're probably going to be spending the same amount of money. Um, but you're going to have two eyes on your project, and they can correct each other. Like, hey, I'm an artist. I think this piece should just be here. And the graphic designer will be like, you know what? Yeah, you're right. I think that could go there. And then the graphic designer goes, can you change this here so that way it looks better on this part of the page? Mm -hmm. And because so, I really need yeah. to put text over there, and your illustration's a little too close. Yep. So could you... Could you extend the background and maybe redraw it so that it curves in this direction? Yeah, you know, like they can the both use their trained eyes to help you together. So it's almost like you have a team instead of just you and a person you're getting to draw for you. And there are some, there are some illustrators and cartoonists who, do, <laughs> who can do both. And I can, there's a guy, uh, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, James Stowe, who does a online strip called uh, Sidekick Quests. And his art is beautiful, he's got a great eye for layout. Um, but I think most, um, I mean, I, okay, I can't speak for everyone. I am not a good you know, person. <laughs> I'm not a good graphic designer. I would love to study graphic design more. Um, but you really, the best of all worlds, I think you want to. Right, so I, I do do both. I do some illustration. It's not my primary focus, but I do illustration. My illustration is very style specific, much like yours is, you know, you can look at your work and know that it's yours. You can look at my work and you can say, oh, that's definitely Heidi, right? And your game may not be appropriate for my style of illustration at all, but that doesn't mean I can't help you, right? Like, you still need a graphic designer, and I'm really good at working with illustrators 
So even if you find someone, you're like, you look at their portfolio, and you can look at their portfolio from two different sides. What am, am I looking at graphic design? Am I looking at illustration? Do I like this person's illustration? Do I like this person's graphic design? What, what aspect of their work is, is something that I want in, incorporated in my game? So Jamie, you're hiding back there with a the question? <laughs> <laughs> can be really, really, really difficult to try to figure out what is in the imagination of a non-artist. That is the perpetual struggle, especially if you're doing work long distance, which I don't know about you guys, but I do a lot of yeah. my work over talk, just talking to people over email, and that makes it even harder to figure out what it is that they like or don't like about a project. And Honestly, the best I can say is I've just always plugged away at it. I've always just kind of come back with more questions and come back with, well, what, what was it? You know, tell, tell me more about how my work was not what you were looking for. Just don't hold back. I'm not, you don't, I'm not going to, my feelings aren't going to be hurt. Well, Susan gave me that look. Maybe a little bit. <laughs> we're very emotional people. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just keep trying to communicate. I have never come across an instance where I've had someone say, screw you, I'm, I'm out, right? That hasn't happened. What usually happens is someone says, this is terrible. Tell me why it's terrible. Well, because of this. Okay, I'll change that. Oh, it's still terrible. Why is it terrible? Well, because of this. And eventually we'll get to a place where they're happy with what they found. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's completely like that. A way to try to avoid it as much as possible, give us as much guidance and references Go to Google, find images that you like that are similar or whatever to what you want. Uh, maybe a pose or maybe a background. Give them to us. We can use them as references for our art so it's what you want. The more you give us, the less chance we're going to hit a dead end. That's very true. Send your artist source material. Send and don't be afraid to do a little stick figure drawing for us. We don't care if you can't draw. It makes us feel better. It makes us feel better. <laughs> and we, we can see what's in your head. I would, I would just add to that, um, again, really, really solid. This is, um, one thing is an art director or a game company should know what they're getting into, roughly what the style you can do is. They shouldn't be asking you to do something you can't do or you don't want to do. I mean, they should, I, I um, and a lot of times, there's a lot of warning signals working with new companies uh, can pop up early on in the conversation. And, you know, don't be afraid just to back out. You know, I've turned down some projects and I've felt so good about turning them down because uh, it just seemed like it was going to be turning into a boondoggle. And um, artists, uh, I think, are somewhat reluctant to say, no, uh, especially when you're starting off because you may not be getting a lot of work and you may want to take on everything. Um, but there is, you know, actually saying no is a great feeling. It kind of, it's like hitting a deadline with all of the, without all of the inconvenient work, you know, beforehand. <laughs> uh, but I have literally had a sense of relief when I've just turned down a project and said, yeah, I don't think we both want the same things here. No, nothing wrong. I can point you to some people who can probably give you what you would like. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it's, I mean, once you're into a project, it's more difficult. But you know, if it's, I think communication is so huge, and it should be frequent communication in any case between the artist and the uh, publisher or the publisher's art director. Mm -hmm. And that if you can just keep talking back and forth all the time, that, that is possibly a way to avoid a lot of these that's not what I was thinking about at all, the kind of conversations. Yeah. They communicate constantly. Always stay in contact with the artist. Never lose contact with the artist during yeah. the work. Email every day just to say hi. Yeah. You never will lose contact. Always check up. Ask for progress pictures. Anything. What? I'm sorry. I didn't mean no, to. No, go ahead. One yeah. of the, the, probably early on, the best, uh, and I, I did not take this, I did not even know if this advice existed at the time, 
but when I, my first professional gaming gig was Illuminati New World Order uh, with Steve Jackson Games back in 94, 5, 6, somewhere in that period. And I had asked Steve, I, I had played Magic the Gathering, and I got my wife to play Magic the Gathering so she wouldn't hate gamers. Um, <laughs> Bitter side story to that. She got all the good cards. Black Lotus, Black Lotus. <laughs> oh, um, but um, Steve, you know, said that they needed illustrators for the, they needed another illustrator to finish off 20 cards. Could I draw in Watchmen style, the old comic book Watchmen? And I said yes, never having drawn in Watchmen style before in my life. Um, and some cards, Steve, this was before uh, you know, web browsers were a thing. In fact, this was just on the cusp. So you know, Steve couldn't just send me to a picture saying, this is what I want. So one of the most uh, insane examples of that was I had to draw a boot, uh, just a boot walking, trampling something. And that piece of art got sent back six times by Steve. And I was just so determined to get this right that I just smiled and kept sending something slightly back. And you know, slightly different the next time, the next time, the next time, until finally it was what Steve wanted. Uh, so I kind of created my own problems there because I said I could do this. And, and I'm, I'm actually kind of proud of how my Illuminati art turned out. Um, but yeah, just, you know, there will be times when you know, I just felt like I really wanted to get this right. And getting a boot right the sixth time was my own little small victory. <laughs> and I think this ties into your question earlier about um, what, how to get good art cheaply, right? So one of the ways to get good art cheaply is to find that perfect match, right? So rather than get an artist who isn't really your style and try to wedge them into what you're looking for, if you just find someone who breathes out what you're looking for, that is going to be so much more efficient for you and more enjoyable for the artist. Mm -hmm. So part of that opening conversation when you talk about budget, you should also be talking about style and making sure that you've got a good match both financially and aesthetically. Yep. Kind of connected, it seems like there's an implicit assumption in all the answers there that the goal is to be something that the designer says, I love that, that's what I imagine, that's what I want. Is there ever a situation where the designer could I don't really like it, but you're the expert, so let's go with that. And how would you decide between those two if that is um, a perspective you could take? Third parties are great for that. If you have a friend, if you have your mom nearby, you have somebody who doesn't even care about games or art in general, show it to them. See if they like it. Because that's always the thing is we're artists, we get a little blind to our art sometimes. We don't always see the issues, or sometimes we see more issues than there actually are. Um, and you're a designer, and you're just going to, you know, maybe you're just excited and you love everything you're seeing. Show it to somebody. Um, I have a guy who's like, yeah, I showed it to my mom, and she's like, she pointed this out, and I'm like, I didn't see that. He didn't see that. But she saw it because she was a third party, and she had never seen it before. And that's a huge thing. Just pull in a friend. Have them just look at it. And that's a great way to just be like, oh, I, you're right. And that will help polish it. That will push it to the next level. Um, and there's this there's a weird saying um, that I've seen around a lot. And there's a, they say you have to pick one, you have to pick two things for your artist. Um, there's time, quality, and cost. You can only have two of those. If you want it to be quick, it's not going to be cheap, or it's not going to be good quality. You have to pick two of those three. And sometimes, if you just you know you don't have a time limit, then you're probably going to have good quality, and you might have good cost. So, and you, you, you kind of got to pick and choose with that things because we have lives and we need to get paid just like you guys do. Um, so, you kind of, that kind of fits in with it. I think that, that really the answer to your question is so situational, right? It's, it's almost impossible to give you an actual answer because it depends on so many variables. It, um, you know, sometimes you're in for a penny and for a pound, right? And you just are like, oh, well, let's just go with it because, eh. <laughs> Um, but sometimes you can you can just be like you know what this isn't working let's try it again. So it's there's so many factors involved time, money, all of okay. it, and it's going to depend on your situation. How should we go about shopping for artists? Should we just go to our local game con and go to Artist Alley or oh, um, yeah. look at who designed the box of their favorite <laughs> game? And, 
Yes. Next question. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, yeah, seriously, that, those are great. Um, Artist Alley's, especially if you're publishing your first games and you don't have a lot of resources, you're trying to find somebody who suits your style, um, you're trying to find somebody who's willing to work, you know, possibly for a little less money or possibly for a proportion of the Kickstarter, the Kickstarter funds. Um, you know, talk with people, talk with artists. Also, you know, check out local art schools. Uh, MATC's got a couple of programs which would you know, possibly be very relevant to new publishers. Um, get involved in uh, the local gaming community, and there are going to be artists who hang out there, most likely. I mean, Madison's got such a huge community of professional uh, game designers, artists. I mean, I'm still tripping over people who I didn't even know were in town. Um, and, uh, but yeah, those are, uh, artist alleys are great. Um, I, the problem, uh, if you're not, I mean, yeah, just educate yourself on the artists, on their work, on their previous work. Um, you know, try and uh, talk with people, go after the conventions, buy them a drink. Artists love it when you buy them a drink. Hint, hint, we hint, love hint, drinks. Hint. Um, you know, it's uh, strike up conversations, hang out, talk with, you know, small game companies, see how they found their particular people. Uh, you know, they're probably, in an in this is a very, uh, the industry's growing at a great rate. Uh, you know, we're kind of in this bizarre golden age of board gaming that I never thought I would see in my lifetime. Um, but there are still enough, you know, people coming in who are new who like to just be in gaming because it's cool and it's fun and they like gaming. Um, so yeah, just send probes out. You know, be be like the Empire in uh, Episode Five and send the probes <laughs> all around. Uh, that shopping at a convention is particularly awesome because you're going to find someone who understands games. So there are online places to look for artists. You can go to a college, which is a very economical way to find art. But it's going to be harder to find someone who understands games. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of your thing out there. Um, I made a list for you guys, because I can. Uh, so if you want to either jot them down or just try to remember them, DeviantArt. Anywhere, any artist on DeviantArt is probably for hire. Um, Draw Crowd is a site that I found recently. Um, it's still, I think it's still fairly new. Um, great place to find artists. Conceptart.org. Great place to go to. Artists go there. Especially people looking for artists go there. Um, uh, Fiverr. It sounds weird because it's a site where you pay things for $5, but it's a great place to find artists who you can pay them $5 for a sketch, but then you can upgrade to finished product. And there are tons of great artists on there. Uh, Patron, and then Board Game Geek. They have a whole forum dedicated to artists. Uh, the Game Crafters Chat and the Game Crafters Forums. There's probably five, six artists in chat every once in a while, and then there's tons more on the forums. Um, so those are just some great places to go to find artists online if you're a little antisocial like I tend to be sometimes. So. <laughs> Let's look at the old-fashioned guy first. <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly, it's taken me long enough to find pens and paper I like. I love drawing. I love the feel of a pen on paper. I love the magic of ink on paper. I love seeing something come to life that way. I like having, holding a finished cartoon illustration in my hands. Um, I, I should have brought some along. I wasn't thinking. Um, but I will, I will, I've got these wonderful pencils, which I love. I've got wonderful pens that I love, and I've got, you know, terrific bristle board paper. Um, I do all of my line work on uh, paper, physical media. 
Uh, I've tried using tablets. I've had mixed results. They're okay, but I I still feel really I like I like having things in my hand. I still buy CDs. You know I I I, um, I but there is something you know about for me the feel and I know you know the feel is can be replicated on tablets. I just like pen and paper. Um, so I will do very light sketches first in pencil. Uh, using the, a pencil called the Palomino, uh, um, wonderful, wonderful pencil. It's it's just got a great feel to it. Um, then I will use a Faber Castell Pitt Artist Pen. If it's Munchkin or Dork Tower, I will use the Fine. Um, if it's a cover, I will use a slightly larger one. Uh, they've got this one, a 1.5 nib, which gives you a really nice solid line. Um, then I will scan everything in. And if I have to do the color, or if I've got to do touching up, uh, well, actually, normally these days I will do the touching up on the art, on the actual physical art, when, uh, if at all possible, and just have um, a special white ink uh, slash paint and use a brush. Um, again, just because I like having the finished pieces there. Um, most of the coloring for Munchkin, almost all of the coloring for Munchkin, is done by the Steve Jackson Games Art Department, which is phenomenal. They take my stuff and they make it look really great. They are very talented people, people who really know color theory. Again, I just have so much respect for them. I can get by, you know, I'm, like Cobalt's Ate My Baby is a game where I will do the coloring for, and it will look fine. Um, but it would probably look a lot better if somebody who really knows color uh, can do it. But yeah, I'm just really old fashioned. I like pens, I like paper, I like scribbling, I like just the, the crunchy feel of it. So I'm going to probably be somewhere in the middle, too, and I came into this somewhere in the middle of these two, too, in a time, time of the world where um, having a computer was still pretty rare. Um, as a graphic designer, I do everything in Adobe. I uh, was raised in Adobe, right? Um, but when it came to illustration, um, I was trained with physical media, so I still use physical media to start out all of my illustrations. I, I usually do pull some source material off of the web somewhere, print it out, um, put it, blow it up, change it around in Photoshop, put it on my light table. I have a special custom bench that my dad made for me that's got a built-in light table. It makes me so happy. <laughs> and then um, I put paper over top of that. Uh, I, I tend to use watercolor pencils and um, golden acrylics. Golden acrylics are fantastic because you can add any amount of water to them and make they can act like acrylics like you would expect or they can act like watercolors. They do all of this range and they create this, these amazing textures. And then I take, um, take what I paint on, the, on, on my light table and I scan it in. And then depending on what it's for, I'll usually pull it first into Illustrator and create a vector of it. Um, trace everything with um, with a vector brush so that I've got something scalable and also easy to like take chunks and move stuff around with so I'll, I'll start with vector and then I usually pull everything into Photoshop I take the scan of the original and the vector that I built and layer it all together in Photoshop so that you get um, a combination of those crisp digital vector edges and the the texture of the physical watercolor sort of media all in one piece and that's um, that, that that's where I usually end up in because a lot of my um, graphic design layout ends up happening in Photoshop especially for cards or boards um, I'm usually working in Photoshop because there's too many elements for Illustrator to really handle safely and so I've got a Wacom tablet that I can draw on um, to move things around and unless it's a booklet, like if it's, there's a lot of text, and of course I'll take it into InDesign, which is another Adobe. Yeah, I love Adobe. Adobe. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess I'm on the far end of this one. I only work digital. Okay, it's not true. I don't always only work digital, but uh, I only commission digital. Unless I'm in person and I'm drawing for you in person, I only do digital. Um, I have a Wacom Cintiq. It's a 13-inch. Um, it's basically a monitor you can draw on. And uh, I started off with like the little uh, ones you probably see in sort of the little bamboo tablets, um, where it's just like a flat thing. There's no screen. You just draw, and hopefully you know where you're going. Yeah, it's like one of those. It's a lot of hand-eye coordination. Psychological experiments. Where you're like, <laughs> you're looking but not looking when you're drawing. I started off with one of those. I have horrible hand-eye coordination unless I got a controller in my hand. Um, so I switched to an Android tablet. 
uh, just one of those Samsung notes that came out with a little detachable pen. Uh, the thing had pressure sensitivity, it had art programs, and I was on that forever, for like two or three years. Um, and then March of this year, I decided to splurge the money and bought a Cintiq, and it was probably the best thing I've ever done. Uh, my quality has increased significantly, my uh, time it takes me to get it done has increased significantly. Um, Huh? Decreased. decreased. Sorry, <laughs> it's decreased. <laughs> Thank you. My time is decreased because I don't have to go into my tablet and then pull it up and use a mouse on my computer to do Photoshop changes and stuff like that. Um, so I, I strictly do mostly digital. However, because I came to a convention, I brought my little fun tools. Alcohol markers. They are probably my new favorite thing ever. Um, they blend, like who's ever knew a marker could blend? I mean, who knew, right? Uh, they blend smoothly on my gradients. <laughs> yeah, you, <laughs> I didn't know. I was like, markers. Um, however, they are like 50 or $55 for 12 markers. So, go to Dick Flex, they're like 14. <laughs> yeah, our supplies are expensive, that Wacom yeah. tablet. That the Wacom was... tablet, I bought it when it was $1,000. And uh, I want to say a month or two later, it dropped three hundred dollars in price. So I felt like the a Cintiq good or the Wacom, the, the Wacom Cintiq. thirteen. Okay, it's yeah, the, yeah. Um, it dropped like three hundred dollars in price. So I was a little upset, but it was worth it because hey, we're artists and it's tax deductible. It's important <laughs> to have high quality materials, right? Yeah. Like it is. It, oh. good art is based on good materials. If it you is true. Go back to the very first Munchkin. I, I, this is, I mean, I, I'm saying this kind of as a joke, but it is a little embarrassing for me because at the time I was just learning everything on the fly. I was, I drew, I drew the first Munchkin using Sharpies. And <laughs> you can really tell, if you look closely at the line quality on the first Munchkin games, it just, it drives me nuts. I would love, I keep asking Steve, please let me redraw that. Please <laughs> let me redraw that. Um, I don't know why. Uh, I was like just really rushed with that. I didn't have time. I had to get stuff out. And uh, so right now, yeah, line quality is a big thing with me. And it just kills me that possibly the second most popular game I've ever worked on has got the most hideous line quality you can imagine. Um, I want to show you guys an example. So within just switching from a tablet to a Cintiq, tablet, Cintiq, within just like a few months, the quality goes up. You know, if your artist has decent supplies, they can do whatever they want. Uh, before I had my tablet, people offered to buy me one so I could do better art for them. Because they saw what I could do, but they knew I didn't have the supplies for it. Um, you, it you, supplies are huge. The medium you use is huge. Um, it's just, it helps your artist tremendously, depending on what they're using. So. One of the main reasons, I mean, I've seen the Cintiqs, and I've, like, kind of drooled a little bit. I'll admit that. Um, but the thing which is really keeping me back is just the learning curve, the time. And it's you know, right now, I just don't have time to take the classes to really learn the stuff it's, about this. It's just like, not as bad as you it's think. not, I thought it was going to be horrible. It's not, it's not at all. It's like drawing on paper because it doesn't recognize your hand, so you don't have to hold your hand a weird way. You can have it straight up. You can have it laying completely flat. You can have it wherever you want it. I purposely bought the one that doesn't recognize your hand because that's a problem. Yeah, exactly. Um, the, the biggest trick, it, it's not the learning curve. It's kind of like learning a game. I was playing a game the other day where um, I needed to convince my brain to recognize three different things as different, even though they looked very, very similar. And once my brain clicked on that to recognize these three different things, then bam, I won the game, right? Mm -hmm. And the tablet is very similar. Once you train your brain that I'm looking at the cursor, even though I'm drawing here, I'm looking at the cursor, not my hand. You, you know, you make that little cognitive leap and you set up your buttons to do what you want. It happens really quickly, mm -hmm. if you're already familiar with the program, like if you already understand Photoshop. And then you'll find yourself hitting Control Z while you're drawing traditional. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Where's my control Z? <laughs> I pretty much hate all the work I've done two years ago in the past. And there's like a two year period where I'm happy with the work and happy with the work and then I'm doing things a little bit differently and I look back with a very critical eye on my old work. As you may have guessed from me talking about the first Munchkin. 
Um, and that's hard. I mean, I think as an artist, it's good to be really self-critical. Uh, it keeps you at your best. Um, but it also can be a little bit unhealthy. You don't ever want to put anything out that you're ashamed of or that you really don't like. Um, with When I was with Out of the Box, uh, some of those games I was being asked to illustrate and do the graphic design on abstract strategy games, which is you know, probably the last thing you want me, you know, Mr. Funny Muskrat person uh, working on. And I really, you know, at the best there would be stuff I could tolerate, like the, I don't know if you're familiar with the 10 Days series of games, um, really neat travel uh, tile linking games. I should never have illustrated those. I should never have done the graphic design on those. Uh, it was the job, you know, and at a certain point you have to get the job done because you're a professional. These days I might have a really tight bud uh, deadline from a company for various reasons. You know, some of it is understandable, some of it is bad planning. Uh, but the work has to be gotten done on deadline and there will be times when I know what drawing is not my very best. It's not up to the standards I expect of myself. I will try to leave myself a little time where I can go back and fix those drawings to make them the best I can. Sometimes it's not just the time and you have to just live with it. And you have to say, well, of these 100 cards, three of them could have been better. That's not a bad average. You don't like doing that, but it's just, as a professional illustrator, the first word in there is professional. You know, and you've got to get the stuff to the best of your ability on a deadline and on budget. Mm -hmm. And that's completely true. I think all artists eventually look back and they're like, I can't believe I drew that. That's horrible. Why did I draw that? Um, for me, it's been really drastic switching from so many mediums recently where I look back two months, three months, and I'm just like, why did I draw that? That looks horrible because I'm learning and I'm progressing so quickly with all my new tools where it's just like I'm constantly hating everything I'm doing. Um, and I'm also extremely self-conscious. So when I'm working, I'm just like, oh, I hate this. And I'll send update after update after update to my clients because I'm like, does this still look okay? Is this still okay? And sometimes they love it and sometimes they're like, just do it. You're okay. Just go for it. Um, and it's, it's a little, you know, there's times where we just, we look back and we're just like, I'm glad I'm getting better. <laughs> I myself's looking good, and then uh, you know it's you know I think all artists have that time where they're just like. Mm -mm. <laughs> I, to bring up another topic which we've not touched on, I, I'm, I'm guessing that most of you guys are coming in from the publishing, game design point of view, and you're looking for artists, not artists who are looking for you know game design opportunities. One thing which is really important when working with an artist is the communication. And if the artist is not communicating with you, make sure you're communicating with them. Don't wait until the deadline to ask how the art's coming. Ask how the art's coming a week into the project, two weeks into the project. Ask for updates. The artist should be supplying you and there shouldn't be this back and forth so you've got an idea. Uh, one of the, um, I'm on an industry mailing list, and one of the main sources of complaint uh, from publishers is the artist who flakes. Um, and some artists do flake. Some artists are not professional. Some artists don't realize um, how important deadlines are, or how, how, how seriously they have to be taken. There's this uh, Douglas Adams line a lot of creatives like to quote. He loves deadlines. He loves the whooshing sound they make as they... You know, pass by. And this is hideous. Um, I mean, it's very funny, it's very cute, but you know, people are getting paid here, people need to get product out, people need to get their games out. You've got to be so professional, both sides have got to be very professional. Um, so make sure contact is always there, make sure communication is always there. You know, ask for updates, ask for, and the artists should be giving you Mm -hmm. And they should be, you know, there are various reasons why they might not. You know, things could be busy, it might not be their fault, or they could just be a real flaky artist um, who reads too much Douglas Adams. Um, but, you know, make, make sure that you're always in contact. And, you know, don't wait until the day of the deadline to say, so is it done? Um, it's got, it, is a, it is a partnership. It's got to be truly both sides. It's, it, there should be... Um, you know, no adversity in this. Um, you know, you guys are both trying to make something great out of this. You talk about the difference between art that you do for yourself and for fun and art that you do for projects or for others. What, how do you keep yourself inspired and, you know, what's the difference between what you do for fun if you even do it for fun? Maybe you're burned out on art from work. 
my, my hobbies were gaming and cartooning. And those have both become my profession. Um, but every day when I sit down at the drawing table, even if it's a really tight deadline, I get to be drawing. I get to be cartooning. And it's fantastic. Um, I will do art for myself. I don't have enough time. I'm trying to make more time to do art for myself. Um, and especially with Dork Tower, uh, the comic strip. That's been very uneven schedule-wise this year. So I'm really trying to take a much closer look at how I'm using my time and how I can better use my time. Uh, because when I'm drawing, I feel fantastic, if it's for me or if it's for somebody else. I love getting lost in a piece of art. Um, you know, my favorite pieces are like the large covers I will get to do for Munchkin um, with a lot of detail. Uh, those just really, I still at this, this point in time, I still feel so free and so I feel like I'm flying when I'm drawing. When, when you get this magic of ink on paper coming together in a way that you enjoy. Um, so there's not, I mean, I, I enjoy both aspects of it. You know, the art for me, uh, the art for a client, I just love arting. <laughs> My kind of personal recharge art is is kind of like reading. Like um, I've talked to authors who say they have to read in order to write better. And I copy paintings. That's what I do. I, I have some favorite artists, um, Aubrey Beardsley, Eugene Grasset, Alphonse Luca. And I will I'll print out one of their pieces that I love, and I'll put it on my light table, and I'll put a piece of paper over it. I put a Tolkien. It's so much fun to copy too. And and I will make make my own version. And it's it's not you know it's 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 like reading a book. You know I'm I'm when by copying that painting, I'm discovering that painting. I'm learning about that painting. I'm learning about how that artist thinks about line and color. That's, that's kind of, I guess, what I do for fun artistically. I'm not making original pieces. I'm actually sitting around copying <laughs> my favorite art. Um, I'm a little similar. So uh, usually if I'm drawing for myself, it's for a game I'm designing. But occasionally I like to draw just, just something wacky. Maybe I had a funny dream I wanted to draw it or whatever. Um, but there's times where for fun, you know, you go and you find artists that are better than you and you go and find famous artists and you look at their stuff and you're like, oh, that'd be so cool. And you try to draw it. And you, you follow their lines or you, you, know, you take this whole piece into your program and you, and you trace it. And that's how artists learn. Like, we, just, we didn't learn how to draw just magically. We practice, just like anybody else. You, while you're playing basketball, you watch other sports people and how they play. That's how people teach you, re repetition, basically. And uh, that's what I do for fun is I love learning to draw the way other people draw. Um, it expands our styles, it expands our knowledge. Um, it's a great way to learn color theory. Uh, it's just, I mean, there's artists out there that do crazy things, like, you know, normally warms are like reds and cools are blue, but there's people who use weird ranges of colors for light, and it's just like, you learn these cool things. And that's what I love doing to kind of cool off after drawing a bunch of complicated roller coasters. <laughs> <laughs> I work, I work fast because my training came from newspapers, uh, doing you know, cartoons on deadline, doing illustrations on deadline. Um, for me, a perfect day would be to get up in the morning, get to the studio by about 8.30 in the morning, do a Dork Tower comic strip, do four Munchkin card illustrations, and then by that point, I, I try to limit myself to about four hours a day drawing simply because I've, I've in the past, on huge deadlines, I've developed a tennis elbow, and it's not fun. Um, and then in the afternoon, use the afternoon for more of the business side, the creative, you know, writing, 
replying to emails, you know, having meetings, talking with people on the phone. Um, a full uh, cover for a project like um, the Munchkin Pathfinder was a big cover with a lot of details. Probably that will take me a couple of days. Um, I could probably get that done in a day if I had to, but you know that's something which I really want to spend a lot of time on and really, really enjoy. That's um, so if I was working on a board game and it had a board and a deck of cards and maybe a few chits and a rule book and a box, um, if I've got really great art direction and everything's already there and I know just what I'm going to do, I can do that in a little over 100 hours. And that is usually spread out over the course of two or three months just because of the turnaround time of sending stuff back and forth where I'll send something off and maybe I've got things I can work on while I'm waiting for a response on what do you think about this style for the card layout or whatever, right? Um, I can be working on the board. But there's, there's time lost in bouncing back and forth. So something that probably I, technically if I just sat, woke up every morning and worked on it all day and then was gonna, I could do it in, a, in, in less than a month, it gets spread out over three months because, because of that bouncing back. Um, so I also work pretty quickly. Um, for an example, Parkies was about 65 custom rides and it took me a month. Um, I think I finished three days before deadline. Um, but it's like some projects, you know, if I'm having a ton of fun, it's something ridiculous and crazy and um, I work quick. And usually I try to keep contact with my designer constantly. So I'll send stuff and send stuff and send stuff. Um, but usually I work, I work pretty quick. So I will spend, well, so I'm a little different. These guys are like, you know, I wake up in the morning. Well, I wake up at noon or one o'clock and I will stay up until 6 a.m. in the morning. I'm a complete night owl. Um, like people, like I was telling people earlier, I've been up at like 8 or 9 a.m. every day for this con and it's horrible. <laughs> I don't know how you people do it. <laughs> um, so, but I, I will, you know, I'll, I'll pump it out as quick as I need to if I'm given an extended period of time. Um, I worked on a game called Table Golf, like 40 pieces or something like that. And he was like, oh, well, I need it by like June or July, which was like three months from then. And I'm just like, oh. Here it is in two weeks. Because if I don't do it, I won't do it. And that's just it. If we procrastinate, we'll and you know, maybe I'll forget I needed to do something or so I, I prefer to get it done quicker than extending using the whole time I'm given just because I want it to be done. I want you to have it when you need it, and I want you to have time to work with it. And then I have time to do changes. Um, because if they if I give you something at deadline and there's changes, well that cuts into my time for another project or um, for like Honey Wars, I would do a few things every week. If I had given it to them on deadline, changes would go into my time for the next week. So I try to do what I can as fast and quick as I can um, with my time for the day. So, um, but I have to make sure I don't hurt myself in the process because it's true. Like he he got tennis elbow. I have carpal tunnel, and that's from too many years of computer gaming. I play World of Warcraft <laughs> um, and frisbee golf, uh, but. Um, so, you know, you gotta do it so, but then we have to make time for our families. We have to, you know, my husband hates that I stay up late, so I have to make sure I spend time with him. Uh, and of course, my DVR is probably full right now, so I have to do that. But, um, you know, and we, you know, we can spend hours on it, but. That, the, the family thing is really important to me. For me, that's the one thing I won't sacrifice. And so, I, I watch very little television. Um, in fact, I only just started, like a week ago, watching Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, you know, which is you know, everybody's been raving about. Um, but for a, for a full uh, size project, um, I, I request from Steve Jackson Games that for a typical Munchkin core set, 160 to 170 cards, that I get eight weeks to work on that. Because there are other things I need to juggle in. You know, there's, I've pulled back, way back on conventions, uh, but I still like getting out there and like traveling and like seeing my family who live elsewhere. Um, for a 100 card supplement, I'll ask for six weeks. And for anything under that, I ask for four weeks. Because you also have to like schedule it into existing projects at the time. So even though, 
it's only going to be a 15 card set. You still need a couple of weeks just to arrange everything else so you can get the time to work on that and give it the time it deserves. Yeah, as um, freelancers, oh, it is impossible for us to, you know, sit down and make art at 8 a.m. and stop making art at 5 p.m., right? Like, that's not a thing that we can do. There's a lot of corresponding that happens. He does at the end of the day. I do the first thing I do is sit down and do all of my corresponding and figure out how that's going to sort out for the rest of the day. And then uh, draw or do art for, you know, four to six hours. And then I pick my kids up from school. You know, like that's, that, so having, have, you can't, you can't do eight to ten hours of drawing in one day. That's not a thing that's possible. I, I've got a <laughs> wonderful program called Freedom which blocks internet access. And I've really, the internet has, if anybody here follows me on Twitter, I'm sorry, A. Um, but B, I, that's not a really productive use of my time. And so when I'm at work, whether I'm staying at home um, or going to the studio, I need to use a program like that, which just blocks all web pages for eight hours. And it makes it, it's kind of wonderful. It's sort of, I mean, I find it very freeing. It's, you know, if I go to the studio, a lot of times I'll just leave my laptop and leave my cell phone and just bring my, I, um, my iPod, which has got no connectivity, but it's got all my music on it. And it's just, it's a wonderful feeling just being there with pens and paper and unlimited potential and nothing but music. Yeah. Um, to add to it real quick, like he was talking, you know, you were talking about how much of the time does it take us to do certain things. Well. It's also, you have to kind of base your deadline off of that. Some of us will request a certain amount of time. Um, so that means don't come to us with like a week deadline. You know, give us enough time, ask us how long we might need, and then how long you might need, and we can work out a decent time. Um, but make sure we have enough time, because you don't want to overwork your artist, because you won't get what you want. I will, um, I try to very carefully, if I can, uh, layer projects so they don't overlap. Um, I don't like juggling projects. I feel like if I'm working on something, I get in the groove, and if I switch to something else, I might lose that look I need for that. So um, I, I will work on games for a long time. Like So they need something now, but they don't need something else for a month. I need to make sure I keep everything the same for that game and the same for another game. Um, Style-wise, so I have a game that uses strictly cell shell, shell, cell shading, sorry, and um, and it uses like there's a lot of gore, but I have to make sure it's kid-friendly gore. If that makes any sense. Um, <laughs> it's and, a door gore. <laughs> it's a door gore. Um, it's a zombie game basically, and um, I worked on it for a while, and then I switched off of it because he didn't need anything for a while. He ran a Kickstarter, then he needed all this new art, and I'm just like, okay. I have to put this aside so I can get back into this style because if I'm doing soft shading, high detail stuff, I can't necessarily do this cartoony zombie thing. Um, because when you're switching styles like that, sometimes you instinctively like, I have to soft shade this, I have to add this detail here. I'm like, oh wait, I can't. This doesn't have this before. So I try to separate all my things out unless I absolutely have to get something done. Which for me, normally I'm pretty good at budgeting out my time like that, so I normally don't have that issue. Um, I only overlap if someone decides to take up my time for like a month, and then I probably have to switch in a few things. Um, but usually I'll only take small projects if I'm on a big project. I have a half a, design, half a dozen things going on right now, and, and they're all, but they're all very different, right? Like um, I've got a project that's very close to the end, and I'm just struggling with the printer. You know, it's just this big technical fight, you know? I've got something that I'm just starting and I'm doing concept stuff for. Um, I've got my restoration work. Um, I've got one where I'm working with a designer. Well, she's not really a designer, but she's working on a game because she's got an educational fit niche that she wants to fill, so I'm trying to teach her how to design a game. You know, so each of these things are, are different. And when I wake up in the morning and I go through my email, I figure out what's more impor most important today, and that's what this one is. Knowing, yeah, knowing first thing in the morning what I'm going to be doing is important. Uh, I normally got eight to ten projects I'm juggling 
And it's not so much of a problem for me because my style with most of them will be relatively similar. They're going to be like some variations, but it's the style I enjoy. It's the style I want to perfect. Um, uh, but yeah, it is, it is uh, difficult, especially like those times when um, I tend to put my own projects at the back of the queue and put clients first. Um, the, and those times when I start whittling down the client projects I'm working on and I feel like, okay, I finally got time to work on my own stuff. That's invariably the time somebody calls up and a new Munchkin deadline is on or uh, something really important has to be tackled right away. Uh, but it's, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with the juggling uh, because, again, you know, my style is pretty similar. It all sort of feeds off everything else. It, it, um, it's not the ideal situation, and I'm trying to keep a, more of an eye on that, but it is what it is. I do a lot of that for Munchkin and for other projects that I'm working on. Um, I normally get paid separately for that, um, a flat fee for pieces which aren't going to be out there for sale. Uh, I'm very uh, happy to do that because the promotional aspect is something I think is really important for the artists to be involved in. It helps the project, it helps themselves. It's very seldom something which you just, you throw it out there to the wild and you never have to think about it again. I've definitely done a lot of images for, for most of my projects to help promote them. And even when I was doing just packaging design, there was a lot of end caps and things like that. So, yeah, as a, as a graphic designer, I am asked to design various marketing materials. Um, I am asked to do it quite often as well. Um, and there's what I call the worst case scenario is when I'm not asked to do it, they do it, and then they ask me to fix it. <laughs> um, and there was this thing I posted on Twitter recently, and it's, I do it will cost you 100. I do it and you watch will cost you 200. You do it by, and then there's like a whole list of this. And then at the end, it's a, you do it by yourself will cost you 3,200. And it's basically because you're spending time, effort, and then you're going to end up going back and asking me to do it again. Why waste that time and that effort when you can just have me do it? And so sometimes, and your artist might not even be comfortable doing marketing material, so you can always ask them. Maybe you need a graphic designer to do it. Um, but if you can get someone else to do it, you should probably get someone else to do it. Um, so yes, I've done it, and it's actually quite fun. Um, I also will, depending on, they're not as big now, but I used to do a lot of flash banners, um, which are like animated banners, which some people hate them, and some people like them, and you just got to do them properly. They shouldn't be flashing and stuff like that. So I know you had a question back there. Um, for me, so I like, I throw in a few, and for me, I'm usually pretty generous with my time. If it's just like, you know, I open it up, I do, 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 and it's good, you know, it's just something really small that I can fix really quickly, I'm not going to charge somebody for that, even if it's like 10 little things, because if it's going to take me less than an hour, I probably won't charge you for it. But if it's something where I'm going to have to spend a decent amount of time on it, I will probably charge. And for me, it's usually... If I actually have to go into like the random layers and adjust things, and there's lots of erasing and reshaping and stuff, um, it really just depends on how much I have to do. Um, I'm usually pretty lenient because it, you know, if it's something, especially if I'm at fault for the mistake, um, I'm definitely even more lenient. Like I forgot to fill something in, or I forgot to fix this line or something. Um, but I know that for a lot of people, it's like you, you know, tell us early for these fixes. Because the earlier you catch it, the less likely we're going to charge you for it. It's, I mean, that's difficult for me to answer simply because most people know almost exactly what they're going to get with my work going into it. Um, so with Munchkin, with Steve Jackson Games, 
I actually don't even send them pencil sketches for the most part anymore. If it's a cover, I'll do some pencil sketches, uh, but if it's actual card work, I'll send them the inks. It's just it's more efficient that way. There may be, with 170 cards, there may be 10 that they want changes on. Most of those changes are minor. Um, if I was working with somebody else, I mean, I know I would probably start getting annoyed after a third request for changes. Um, and that would mean that there was some miscommunication going on somewhere along the line. Um, but it's been a long time since I've actually had to worry about that. And yeah, and I charge hourly, so if it's my mistake, of course I'm not going to charge you. Right? If you found my oops, then dude, that's on me. Um, and if it is less than five minutes, I'm not going to bother turning on the timer. Right? Like, it's not worth, worth it to even do that. I'll just make I just want to make you happy. Mm -hmm. um, but charging, that's that is the reason I charge by the hour is that I came across situations where there were these perpetual changes. Mm -hmm. Yep, I had a worst case scenario. So. Um, there was a Kickstarter that went off uh, a few months ago called MZM, or Midnight Zombie Marathon. And one of the rewards was you could back for a zombie portrait of you or a family member or whatever. And I'm like, oh, well, that'd be cool. I can totally do that for people. And so they're, they send me these pictures. And for one, people don't always send pictures. Or they send low-res pictures. Um, but I got worst case scenario when you go to somebody who was, had low self-esteem. So I was like, oh, well, can you change my hair like this? Can you change my pants? Change this color? No, change it to this color and said, no, try this color. Uh, and that's when it gets a little, you're like, okay, I, I see what the issue is, but I don't think the art is the issue. Um, and so if it's some, you know, and that's what I was saying earlier is show it to somebody else, let somebody else take a look at it, see what they think, because maybe you're self-conscious about it or maybe I'm self-conscious about it. Um, I like the idea of somebody with low self-esteem being made into a zombie and then having questions. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I look pretty enough as a zombie. Yeah. How many hours are you at your studio? I am at my studio, I would like to be there more hours, but real life gets in the way. So a lot of times I will be there at 8.30 in the morning after I drop my daughter off to school. And I will try to work until through doing just the art, uh, the drawing aspects, until at least 12.30 to 1 o'clock. At which point I then try to fit in, and I haven't for a while, but I try to fit in some time at the gym so I can get some kind of balance that way. And once the afternoon hits and once you start having to run errands, then everything goes to pot. And I, I want to be at my daughter's school either at 3.30 or 4 o'clock to pick her up. And then family time starts. So. You know, for me, it's been really hard trying to smush in the business stuff in the afternoons, and I've got to really find some way to balance out that. Yeah, I'm putting in about 30 hours a week in my studio because I have kids, again, that I send off to school at 7.45, and then I pick up at 2.30, and they're my top priority. That's the way to do my life right now. And so I, I, in between that time, I'm in the studio. Um, sometimes I'm fencing. It's a little physical activity. Um, and other than that, I try to squeeze, and that's obviously not 30 hours, right? So I try to, <laughs> I try to squeeze in bits and pieces um, on evenings when after they're in bed or weekends if they're off doing something else. Um, I try to screw it together. But it's, um, being being a, primarily a parent and then working freelance, you freelancers kind of have to work around that. Um, so my studio happens so I work on a computer, it happens to also be my gaming computer, so I spend a lot of time in my studio. Um, but for me, it's, uh, it's strange. So I do wake up you know, around noon. Um, I will work for three or four hours, and then that's when it's like dinner time uh, with the husband, or we'll go play disc golf. Um, and then by the time he goes to bed around nine or 10, I'll work for that many hours until either it's done or I can't keep my eyes open anymore. Um, but I'll probably put in anywhere from 20 to 40 hours a week, depending on the project. Um, and it, it, you know, it's just like, if you can't work on something, we will usually walk away, just because it's sometimes better to come back with a fresh eye. So there will be some days where I'll work less, um, or if there's too much stress going on, I'll skip it. Um, but then we have to catch up, of course. So yeah, I, I mean, I spend a decent amount of time uh, in my studio, uh, but not always working in my studio. <laughs> My daughter is very interested in art, so I'm thinking one of these days soon, possibly unpaid intern. Oh, um, <laughs> yes. Get your little art monkey.
<laughs> I, closing statement, I feel so freaking lucky to be doing this. I realize I've had a couple of huge breaks in my career. Um, I, I just can't believe how ridiculously lucky I am to get to draw professionally and feed my family because of this. It's, it's huge, huge, huge. And it just always makes me want to be better and keep doing better work and keep making people really happy. I mean, it's really nice being in a position where you can, you can help some people get over a bad day just making them laugh with a drawing or with a game or just taking their minds off of problems. Uh, it's a huge, huge privilege. I don't ever want to take that for granted. What you said. <laughs> so true. So true. Um, I, I, not all of my employment, freelance employment, comes through the gaming industry. Um, and I do this restoration work in between freelance projects. Um, but I love that every day I'm I'm drawing, I'm, I'm getting paid to do what I would want to do anyway, um, in following the things that I love, which is art and games and swords. Those are the three <laughs> important things. I also love swords. <laughs> um, art and game and swords is my law firm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm, yeah, you can tell we all love what we do. Um, and it's, it's a ton of fun. We enjoy doing it. and. We enjoy doing it for others. Um, I think just having, seeing our stuff out there, like I've walked through the con and seen a few of my games floating around. It's just like, it's amazing. Um, and I think there's just a huge uplifting, a huge reward, rewarding feeling for just seeing it out there. Um, but there is something I did want to touch on that uh, no one asked. We didn't really talk about contracts. I think it was mentioned earlier and we never got into it. Um, and I know for me, when it comes down to contracts, I don't necessarily need one. Um, emails these days are basically contracts, um, but there are a few things you always want to lay down. Price is a huge thing. Um, date, names, uh, what you're getting, and then what we call, I call them milestones. Um, when you want to see updates, when you want things to be delivered. Those are huge things to make sure they're written down in emails. Um, and don't forget, you got to make cost breakdowns for each thing if there's any additional fees um, and what they're for, and then shipping if it's traditional. Um, and then form of payment. Uh, most artists use PayPal. Um, there's also a few other payment methods, but I think it's probably the general one for online. Oh, sorry. Uh, price, dates, uh, payment type, milestones, um, be, specific, be specific for what you want, um, deadlines, and make sure all your names are in there. Your name, their name, company names. Uh, so if anything comes up, um, and then you should always do like uh, you'll occasionally get fees as if the artist steps out, because um, you will get artists who flake. Um, what you get if the artist flakes? Do you still get to keep the whatever they finished, whatever they paid for? Um, and then of course how you're doing payments. So uh, whether it's half up front, half on the end, uh, in increments. And then if there's any flake fees, like if you, you know, so you can go after them if they owe you money in return for something they didn't do. It's in, it should be in the contract. Um, it should be based on a percentage of uh, your contracted price. Um, I personally would suggest it should be half of the suggested price. Um, if a company flakes out, it's going to be hard enough to get money from them in the first place, and they may be flaking out because of money problems anyway. Um, you should also make sure that all rights to the art go back to you and that you can use it for whatever. Um, that shouldn't even be a question, but it should be in any contract like this. Um, but I think on the average, I've seen it vary from 25% to 50%. Um, more reputable companies will have higher percentages because they are almost never going to flake. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, dealing with new companies, that's always a problem. Uh, new unestablished companies. With all the best intentions in the world, people may just not know the realities 
of the publishing business. They should be, that should be easy enough to keep in one contract. It doesn't really matter. I mean, there will be, uh, you know, especially if you're getting royalties for one and a flat fee for the others, um, that would just be handled with a separate paragraph. Mm -hmm. Yep, just keep them all together. I, I love lists, so I can check them off as I go. Good contracts are great. I mean, I, I just, I naturally fear contracts for some reason, but when you've got a good contract, I mean, it's just, my gosh, this is commitment. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's, uh, but really, everything, like the best contracts, Steve Jackson Games does really great, clear, well-written contracts. Um, I've talked with Steve about possibly, you know, stripping all of the crunchy bits out of a contract and just putting it up as an example of what a work-for-hire contract can be and the points that should be made in one. So maybe I'll get back on him about doing that. And that's really, to take that. and that's great because I think it's important that all artists and creators should have a contract that they can go back to because a lot of new companies won't have a contract. And as long as you know, the artist takes um, the steps to get the contract that they want and get that out there, it's going to be a much happier situation for everyone. Yep, I completely agree with that. Now, I only started doing contracts recently. Uh, I had never done contracts until recently, and I've grown to love them. Because one, it covers me, and it covers the other person. Um, and I don't know why I never used them sooner. Um, so they're definitely, they're definitely great to have. And they don't even need, I, I know you can get them in huge legal jargon, but you don't necessarily need it. Um, but sometimes they're nice to have. You never know. So. Yes, I have a very, very, very simple contract. If a company doesn't have a contract that they want me to sign, my contract is, um, you agree to pay my rate at an hourly billable monthly, and if you don't pay, I stop working. That's really <laughs> yeah, it's basically <laughs> it. Thank you all for coming. Thank you yes. so much. Thank you very, very much indeed.